board just in case they had to back out of it. And we got a social question now from at Grant B117 who asks, how long does it take to complete the fueling operations? You know, it's a great question, Daryl, and, and they started it at uh, 35 minutes because that's really prior to liftoff because that's how really how long it takes for the loading operations to kind of get executed. Uh, the, the crew goes through the process, the ground team of, of loading that propellant, uh, ensuring that they get the proper commodities on board. Uh, the actual sequencing of things might be affected a little bit by the temperature uh, on a given day, but uh, they have that, that process well monitored and they begin at 35 minutes because uh, that's how long it takes uh, to, to get the rocket all fueled up. Thank you for asking or for answering those questions and to you out there for asking the questions, keep them coming. Hashtag Ask NASA on our various social platforms. And again, now that fueling for Falcon 9 has started, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from Falcon 9 in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. The NASA and SpaceX teams have trained extensively for exactly that type of contingency. And so now let's go over to Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for another operations update. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. You can probably tell by the background noise that uh, things are starting to get more exciting now that we're just uh, practically 30 minutes away from launch of Crew 5, certainly counting down the final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon. Uh, with that launch escape system now armed, we are heading for an on-time launch uh, just 32 minutes from now. As you saw, uh, Falcon 9 propellant load began right on time at T minus 35 minutes. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel, which is loaded into a tank at the bottom of each stage, and the other is an oxidizer, and that's loaded into a tank at the top of each stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene referred to as RP-1, or Rocket Propellant 1. Uh, the oxidizer loaded on each stage is a densified liquid oxygen, or LOX. Densified means that it's kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles, and it takes up less volume. And as such, this allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. Now to ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use an ignition fluid called TTEP. When TTEP comes into contact with oxygen, it burns, giving off a green colored flame. Once we have that flame going, we add in the kerosene fuel to the Merlin chamber and the engine ramps up to full power. You might actually be able to see that green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation, uh, which is expected to happen about two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. Right now, we're topping off helium into pressure vessels on both stages. Uh, this is used to pressurize tanks in flight as propellant is pulled out of those tanks by the Merlin turbo pumps. Now, on board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring systems from their crew Stage monitors. Stage one, cryo-helium loading has started. All right, there we just heard that the cryo-helium load has begun. Again, that is going into those uh, pressure vessels that I mentioned earlier. Now, the crew training simulator uh, has included playback of the sounds that uh, were recorded in a previous Dragon capsule uh, during recent flights. So all of the pops and the hisses that the vehicle puts out, um, all the crew has heard those before, though not live. Uh, so they are prepared for all the noises, the extra noises that they're now hearing. Uh, as for the range, continues to report no problems. They are go to support launch. Weather also clearly looking great. I think we're actually seeing even fewer clouds than we were about 20 minutes ago. Uh, we had a less than 10% chance or probability of violation of our weather constraints, also known as a POV. Uh, so that's really good. Uh, that is for um, the launch site conditions. We are also tracking downrange weather conditions as well as uh, launch sites around the world in the unlikely event that Dragon needs to escape. Now, as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time because we're heading to the International Space Station. So at this point in time, if we hear a hold for any reason, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity, uh, which is tomorrow, just under 24 hours from today's planned launch. Uh, at this point in time, at just under T minus 30 minutes till launch, let's turn it back over to Jesse and Sandra for an overview of what's to come until liftoff. Great, thanks Kate. Always great to hear that we've got good weather and it looks beautiful over there at KSC.
For Crew 5, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 29 hours. And as we await T0 in just about 28 minutes from now, the ground operations team is doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. And as we wait for the launch clock to hit zero, we want to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission will look like. Now, once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. About 50 seconds into flight, Falcon's nine engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of a maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. At this point in time, the vehicle will be going supersonic. And once we're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. The first is MECO, or main engine cutoff. And this is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is, of course, our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, and the first stage will make its way back to Earth for landing, while the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, which is SES-1, or second stage engine start number one. And this is where the MVAC engine lights up and propels the second stage, along with our Crew-5 astronauts, to orbit. As stage two head towards its targeted drop off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down to Earth. The first is the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite and shut down. And this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we will wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to touch down on the drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. About three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. And it is worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over Stage the next... Stage two cryohelium loading has started. From there, over the next 29 hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way back to station. All that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Shaniqua in Mission Control Houston. Shaniqua? Thanks, Sandra. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, making sure it is ready to receive Dragon vehicle tomorrow. They're also making sure communication links between the station, Dragon and the ground are working properly. The consensus right now is that everything is proceeding nominally. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the teams in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft tomorrow evening. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the space station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place around an hour and a half after docking. And once aboard, the astronauts will be greeted by station commander Samantha Christopher Reddy, and then the whole station will station crew will join in from for welcoming remarks to the new crew members. Now, due to critical science, this welcoming remarks will be about 90 minutes after the crew is on board. 
Once on board, the crew members will no longer be referred to as Crew 5, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station. Here in Mission Control, Flight Director Greg Whitney is on console overseeing the team for launch, and he will be back tomorrow for docking. We'll be on air continuously through Crew 5's arrival, but live coverage of docking is expected tomorrow around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time. That's it from now from Mission Control Houston. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? Well, it's wonderful out here, Shaniqua. Wish you could be here. We got picnic weather out here at the press site and Launch Complex 39, where we are looking out for the launch of Crew 5 from historic Launch Complex 39A, a beautiful sweeping shot of the lawn where we have our special guests, the media uh, are here. We've got NASA social folks who are out on the lawn. And of course, me and Bob. <laughs> Bob's riding shotgun here as we take our coverage to the next level at the final 23 minutes of liftoff. Now, from the countdown rather, uh, we are just seconds away from the fifth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. Commander Nicole Mann, pilot Josh Cassida, and mission specialist Koichi Wakata and Ana Kikana are strapped into their seats inside the Dragon Endurance at the very top of this rocket here. We can... Uh, we are listening in to the communications as they talk live to the Falcon 9 team. The rocket is fueling, the operation is doing well, and the launch escape system is armed. Of course, that means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 rocket in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations looking and sounding as expected. And we are counting down to our liftoff at just after noon. 12 p.m. and 57 seconds after the hour Eastern time. There was a one second adjustment. That's pretty typical as happens uh, when we get to this stage of the mission. The mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft. Of course, this would not have been possible without the success of the NASA SpaceX Demo 2 test flight now two years ago and of course the safe delivery and return of crews one, two, three, and eventually here in about a week, crew four. Of course, we're happy to have the pilot from uh, Demo 2, and that's Bob Bink. And appreciate you being here, been giving us some great uh, thoughts and explanations about everything that's been happening. Well, thank you, Daryl. I'm super excited to be here for Crew 5 and get a chance to relive my experience during the uh, Demo 2 mission. And it's been a great one so far. We've watched the crew get into the capsule. We've watched, uh, they worked through a couple of issues early on, but those have been cleared. Uh, a suit leak check and a uh, hatch leak check that uh, had to be double checked. Now we're rolling along and uh, moving towards liftoff. A couple things that are coming up as we count down. We're gonna have stage two RP1 load complete. That's in 20 seconds. A few seconds later, we'll get strong back chill. That will begin in order to set the stage for the stage two liquid oxygen load. Of course, propellants load is not an exact science, but once it completes, we'll hear that call out. Stage two, RP-1 load is complete. And there you heard it. Let's talk a little bit about the crew. If you're just joining us, we have a four-person crew that we call Crew 5, and it's commanded by Nicole Mann. She holds a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and is a colonel in the Marine Corps. She was an F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet test pilot and deployed twice aboard aircraft carriers in support of combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Nicole was selected by NASA in June of 2013 and in the years that followed, led the astronaut corps in the development of hardware for our Artemis program. Today, the Crew 5 Commander will be flying into space for the first time and once she reaches space, she will be the first Native American woman to stay on station a historic first for NASA and for her. Absolutely, Daryl. The astronaut corps is a widely diverse, and I'm just proud to see Nicole join that crew on board the International Space Station. 
With her is pilot Josh Cassida. He grew up in Bear Lake, Minnesota. The physicist and U.S. Navy test pilot flew the P-3C and the P-8A, as well as 23 combat missions. He later became an instructor at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, which is a path to NASA for military officers. Cassida is one of more than 100 graduates who have become astronauts, going all the way back to the Mercury program. More recently, he served as capsule communicator in mission control, but today he is the pilot aboard Dragon. It's a seat I know well, and I look forward to seeing Josh support Nicole and the rest of the crew on their way towards the International Space Station. The mission specialist now, Koichi Wakata, he's the veteran, a Japanese astronaut who has a doctorate in aerospace engineering. In 1996, he became the first Japanese mission specialist aboard the space shuttle Endeavour for STS-72. Altogether, Koichi flew four space shuttle missions, a Roscosmos Soyuz, and was on a long duration stay aboard the International Space Station. During his two decade career as an astronaut, Koichi has spent 11 months in space. Bob, you spent a fair amount of time in space yourself. It's great to have a veteran aboard. It, it absolutely is. And uh, in addition to being a veteran, uh, Koichi just has a wonderful personality that I know is just uh, it's key to kind of success on board the space station. Our second mission specialist is Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina. She graduated from the Novosibirsk State Academy of Water Transport in 2006. In 2012, Anna officially became a candidate for the position of test cosmonaut. Crew 5 will be Anna's first flight into space, along with two of her other fellow astronauts. Now, each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 68 once they arrive at the International Space Station. And there you see them there inside Crew Dragon Endurance, the second flight for this Dragon. I want to let you know if you're here locally, you want to step outside and enjoy the launch, we've got a small radio, you can pick us up on VHF radio frequency 146.940 on the megahertz scale, and on UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz FM mode. You can hear that all within Brevard County, right here on the beautiful Space Coast. And you can see the... Stage two locks load has started. Just got the call out that the stage two locks load has started. Putting that liquid propellant into the second stage. Let's check back in with Kate Tice and get an update from Hawthorne. Kate? Thanks, Daryl. We are T-minus 16 minutes away from launch, and everything continues to look great for Falcon 9 and Dragon. Uh, Falcon 9 began prop load at T-minus 35 minutes. Um, the loading of RP-1 fuel on the second stage is complete. Uh, that finished at T minus 20 minutes. Fuel loading continues on the first stage. Uh, it is almost complete. That should be wrapping up here momentarily. Um, densified liquid oxygen loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Those look to be about 80% on the first stage and uh, has only just recently begun on the second stage. So not much there yet. That will, those, that will wrap up at T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes respectively. Now, as for checkouts of thrust vector controllers, uh, what we call TVC wiggles, those are coming up. Uh, we basically check to make sure that the thrust vector controllers are able to actuate the engines themselves. Um, they, that's, what, that's what helps create gimbal uh, for those engines, and, and gimbaling is actually how Falcon 9 steers itself. Uh, so those are coming up along with throttle valve checkouts on the engines. The Dragon mission director and team are currently reporting no issues, so really good on that front. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted, as we can see there. And the crew is strapped in and ready to go, as you can see there on the right-hand side of your screen. Everybody continuing to monitor prop load there on their crew monitors. 
Now, final instructions to the crew come at T minus 10 minutes. At that point, their crew displays will be configured for launch. This setup gives the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding uh, and provides constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll hear the call out uh, that will be in terminal count. And at that point, Dragon will transition to internal power. We'll hear continued call outs on the countdown nets as we get closer to liftoff. As for range, they continue to be go, continuing to monitor the launch corridor uh, and everything remains green. As for weather, we're looking at seven mile per hour winds at the launch site. And as I said before, as the countdown continues, we are seeing fewer and fewer clouds. Just an absolutely stunning day there at Kennedy Space Center. Let's check back in with Daryl to see uh, the last couple minutes prior to liftoff. Thanks, Kate, and it really couldn't be more perfect out here weather-wise for a launch. How about that, Bob? It just looks uh, absolutely stunning to look out and see the, the vehicle ready to go, the crew on board strapped in. I'm just super excited for them. And there's a view of the countdown clock and the historic American flag that has been standing there since the space shuttle program. Now you're looking at a pic of uh, Crew-5. Crew 5 flying aboard the Dragon capsule Endurance, and the booster that you see behind them that they're posing with is a brand new one. Actually was damaged in transit from California to Texas, but it was fixed, repaired. Crew did a great job, the SpaceX team, in getting it all ready. And at the time that Falcon 9 launches Dragon to space, the International Space Station will be 260 statute miles over Australia. Crew 5 will then spend the next 21 hours with mission control team that you see there in Houston, standing by, getting ready for the beginning of this mission. They'll spend 21 or 29 hours, rather, chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow evening. One of the longer transits, Bob. It's true. It's a, a little bit longer than usual, um, or average, I would say, as we work towards Crew-5. But as the launch dates shift around, that changes the time that you can actually arrive on Space Station. Uh, they've got plenty of consumables, so uh, it should be fun to have some time in space. And when they arrive tomorrow evening, we'll have live coverage on NASA TV of docking, as well as the Crew-5 welcome ceremony at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time, 7.15 p.m. Central. And some final thoughts, Bob, as we get ready to watch Crew-5 launch into space. You know, I, my opportunity to sit here and watch Crew-5 go has just been uh, inspiring again to see another vehicle head towards the International Space Station. Again, I'm, I'm excited for them and uh, just hopeful that Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna have just a wonderful mission. I know that they've got a wonderful launch in front of them. Absolutely, and that's what we're rooting for here. And so with T-minus 11 minutes and counting, we're... We're going to spin our chairs around and watch the launch, but we're going to let Pat, uh, Kate and the team focus on the pad as we proceed through the final stretch of the countdown. We'll turn it over to Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in California to take us through. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Daryl. As you can probably tell by the background noise, the crowd is definitely growing here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, certainly one of our company traditions is to watch the launch itself from behind Mission Control, which you see there on your screen. Uh, you can see this is Mission Control Hawthorne, or as you sometimes hear referred to as uh, MCCX. And then, of course, a uh, crowd of employees watching from behind. I personally also stand there if I'm not doing the webcast, so I can confirm it's a great spot to watch launch. Um, I, like I said, as you can see, the, the energy is certainly starting to grow now that we're about to hit T minus 10 minutes. Beautiful view there of Falcon 9 and Dragon on the pad, ready to take Crew 5 to space. We did discuss Dragon, the... SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. Welcome. We would like to give a huge thanks to the NASA and SpaceX team, the thousands of people for their development, preparation, and training in getting Endurance and Crew-5 to the launch pad today, and your continued support in helping to make this a successful mission. We look forward to joining the rest of our Expedition 68 crew members aboard the International Space Station. And a special thanks on behalf of all the crew, to our family and friends. It is your love and support 
that help make dreams come true. Now let's do this. Crew 5 displays are configured for launch. Copy, and Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna, on behalf of the entire team at SpaceX, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And those words from Nicole Mann, the first female commander of a Dragon, as she thanked the many folks that have helped get them to this point. We're now less than nine minutes away from launch today. Upon liftoff, you'll hear a number and letter combinations, which mark different abort zones throughout the flight, as well as some performance calls. The first two are 1A and 1B, and those signify the first stage and will last up to the very north tip of North Carolina. The next are 2A through 2E, and those will come into play once the second stage kicks in, lasting from the top of North Carolina all the way to the tip of Newfoundland in the Northern Atlantic. You'll also hear a spot that is to be avoided, and you might hear Shannon or forward to Shannon, and that actually refers to Shannon, Ireland, meaning they would target off the east coast of Ireland if they were later in that second stage and did need to abort for some reason. So the next major milestone that we're looking towards will come just seconds from now, and that will be when engine chill begins on the first stage of the engine. That's right. So engine chill is basically when we take a little bit of that super chilled, densified liquid oxygen and we flow it through the turbo pumps of the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage. This helps to prepare the turbo pumps and avoid any thermal shock to the hardware when they see the full flow of liquid oxygen during ignition. Uh, we're also expecting the uh, conclusion of uh, prop load um, for the RP-1 on first stage to wrap up at T minus six minutes. Locks load continues to be underway on both first and second stages. Again, wrapping those uh, at T minus three minutes and two minutes. And after that, we'll hear a number of callouts related to Dragon's flight computer. Some will stage be the- one engine chill has started. And you did just hear that call out that stage one engine chill has begun. Coming up in just about 45 seconds, we should expect to hear that RP-1 load is complete. RP-1 load is that densified kerosene or rocket fuel that will help propel the crew into orbit. All of that RP-1 is loaded into the first stage and we are standing by to hear that it was uh, loaded into the second stage as well. Again, we expect that to wrap at T minus six minutes. Uh, the venting that you see on screen is totally normal. That is just some Stage of- Stage one, RP-1 load. It's just some of the super chilled, densified liquid oxygen, uh, uh, just vaporizing as it comes into contact and vents from the vehicle. And coming up, we'll also hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count and then it will be transferred over to internal power. And then we'll hear that propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, which helps add some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for a strong back retract. That strong back will retract a couple of degrees at first and then we will see it swing open completely uh, just shortly or at the moment of liftoff. Falcon 9 tanks will be pressurizing for a strong back retract. Right, and there's that indication that we are preparing for that strong back retraction. Coming up in just a few seconds, we should hear that Dragon is in terminal count. Dragon is in configured for terminal count. All right, there we heard that call. Dragon onboard computers have now taken control of the vehicle. As I mentioned before, first stage locks or liquid oxygen loading is underway and will wrap up at T minus three minutes. And second stage will wrap its locks load at T minus two minutes. Launch teams continue to report no issues and everything remains green and for an on-time launch. Has started. And here in just a couple seconds, you might be able to see the strong back arm as it does begin to retract. 
As Kate said, it will recline two degrees. We can just barely make out that the clamp, on, the clamp arms are now beginning to move. All right, now that those clamp arms are removed, as Sandra said, this will retract by two degrees. Uh, and then at liftoff, the strong back will retract another to 45 degrees, uh, allowing Falcon 9 to clear. Strong back is part of the transporter erector, and the transporter erector is what provides uh, the liquids, the gases, and the electrical connections to the vehicle. It's also what we use to integrate the vehicle in its horizontal position, and we can see that two degree retraction just now. And the next call out that we should hear in about 20 seconds is that the first stage locks load is complete. Stage one locks load is complete. And there we go. All of the oxidizer loaded on stage one. Soon we'll hear that stage two locks load is complete and that will be the last propellant call out we'll hear today. Now less than three minutes until launch. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard the good news that Dragon is now on internal power. Again, the white clouds that you see there at the base of the Dragon trunk, totally normal. That's just the vapor uh, from the liquid oxygen. Again, second stage now wrapping up its locks load. Excuse me, first stage wrapping up its locks load um, just a few minutes ago and now moving toward wrap up of second stage locks load, which will complete at T minus two minutes. Coming up on two minutes until liftoff, standing by for word that stage two locks load has been completed. Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two locks load is complete. There we heard the call out. Falcon 9 is now completely fueled. Wow. All of its propellants. So yeah, close out. So our starting expect loud venting. All of its propellants, and we can see that leftover liquid oxygen uh, now being vented or released, uh, now flowing further away from the vehicle. So nearly 1 million pounds of liquid oxygen in RP-1 now on board Falcon 9. It is fully loaded and ready for launch. And coming up at T minus one minute, we'll hear that Dragon is in countdown. Its flight computer will switch to countdown mode and we'll hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is FTS armed. FTS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. And there you heard it, Dragon's, Dragon is in countdown. Dragon's flight computer in countdown. The flight termination system now armed. We should get the final go for launch from SpaceX launch director Mark Dragon, SpaceX. Godspeed, go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, go for launch. SpaceX reports go, seconds. crew reports go, 30 seconds until liftoff. T-minus 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition, engine's full power, and let's go.
coming up in just a few seconds. We'll hear the call out for stage one throttle down. Stage one throttle down. Falcon 9 engines throttling down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. This period is known as max Q, and once the vehicle moves, there we just heard that the vehicle is now traveling faster than the speed of sound. Once through max Q, we'll throttle those Merlin engines back up. Max Q. Stage one throttle up. Stage one throttle. Stage one Bravo. Copy one Bravo. That call out for one Bravo means we're in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing to get good performance. The crew is already pulling over two G's. And next up is going to be a couple of events in rapid succession. First will be engine chill on the second stage and back engine. And there you heard that call out. And then we'll have Miko or main engine cutoff where the nine engines igniting will cut off in preparation for second stage separation. Then we'll see the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage ignite and continue to carry the crew five astronauts to orbit. Just like we did on first stage, that MVAC chill is intended to help pre-chill the hardware prior to the full flow of that densified liquid oxygen. Stage one throttle down. At this point in time, those nine Merlin engines are beginning to throttle down in preparation for MECO or main engine cutoff. Standing by for MECO. And Miko. Stage two alpha. And Stage separation confirmed. Copy two alpha. There we should see that second engine begin to ignite now. And obviously confirmed by the loud cheer behind us here at Mission Control Hawthorne. And we're also in two alpha for the aborts if needed. Again, second stage is lit and continuing to carry the crew five astronauts into orbit. We're now getting a view of the first stage uh, after that stage separation. The second stage is still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine, and that's on the right-hand side of your screen. First stage on the left-hand side of your screen, making its way back to Earth. We will be attempting to land it on our drone ship, um, which today we are using just read the instructions. Acquisition signal, Bermuda. And we did hear that acquisition of the ground station in Bermuda. The first stage is continuing to make its way back to Earth. And the second stage is going Dragon to continue. Trajectory nominal. Another good call. Trajectory nominal. Drop and copy. Confirmation there from Commander Nicole Mann. You can also sort of see the, the Space Coast there in the background of the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen. It also looks like you can actually see the thrust plume uh, created by the first stage as it's now rotating just out of screen. Second stage is going to continue firing until a little over eight minutes into the flight, really doing the heavy lifting now, getting the crew into orbit. Everything continues to look nominal on both first and second stages. As I mentioned before, the first stage will be making uh, a, a landing on one of our drone ships, which is currently parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. So we can see now that... Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Good confirmation there that we have Dragon good trajectory. Copy. The second stage now traveling over 5,400 miles per hour. Crew is pulling a little more than one G right now. That's going to continue to ramp up, peaking just before we get to second stage cutoff here in just a few minutes from now. First stage will be performing two separate burns, a re-entry burn where we reignite three of the Merlin, vac or excuse me, the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage, 
Uh, we ignite the center engine into radial, radial engines to help slow it down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then the second final burn, and that will be the landing burn on our drone ship. And the single MVAC engine Great. that you see. Trajectory nominal. The single MVAC You're engine that you copy. see on the right of your screen is continuing to fire. We did hear another call out that trajectory is nominal. Crew heading in the direction that they are supposed to be. This single engine can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. Now over 200 kilometers in altitude. We will start to hit events now in a rapid succession as the first stage continues to make its way back to Earth and the second stage continues its burn. Just a couple minutes left in that burn. For those of you just joining us, just over six and a half minutes ago, uh, our four Crew-5 astronauts launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and they are now making their way into orbit on the second stage inside Dragon. Crew Dragon. Which we're hearing that the trajectory on that is nominal. Uh, Dragon copy. They are in, safe inside uh, Dragon Endurance, whereas the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen uh, is making its way back to Earth. We are coming up to the re-entry burn, which as I said before, we ignite three of the nine Merlin engines to help slow the booster down as it re-enters the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere. As the entry burn completes, we'll be in the Stage final- Stage one, entry burn startup. So there we heard the two, call out. You can there see it on your screen that that entry burn has been initiated. And as that entry burn completes, we'll be in the final um, different abort phases here shortly, which essentially correspond to areas along the very northeastern seaboard of the U.S. Stage and then, one entry burn shut down. Great news, that entry burn was shut down. And then those last all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, Atlantic off the coast of Scotland for those abort zones. Everything continues to look nominal for both the first and second Stage stages. And the crew with the second stage still attached is now traveling over 13,000 miles per hour. We're about 10 seconds away from Seco 1. Copy, Shannon. Shannon, stage call one, out. Transonic. That call out for Shannon, Ireland, indicative of our final abort zone. After this, we'll see second stage shut off and we'll be listening for confirmation of a good orbit, which tells us the crew and Dragon are exactly and where they need to be. Down. And there we had confirmation that the MVAC has shut down simultaneously. Uh, the entry. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. And you heard that call for a good insertion. We will coast for a few minutes. There we can see the drone ship coming into view as Falcon 9 Launch attempts. Stage one landing leg deploy. You can see those landing legs have now deployed. And as you can see on your screen, and you can hear by the clapping and cheering behind me, Falcon 9 has landed on our drone ship just through the instructions, parked off the coast of Florida. And again, that second stage separation will be coming up just a couple of minutes now. We do coast for a few minutes after second engine cutoff to allow any rates to or motion to dampen out and settle. And looks like we're gonna get a view of the second stage as it separates here shortly. We did hear that the crew has been successfully inserted into a good orbit. Again, the crew is still attached to the second stage.
We are expecting stage separation to occur in just over a minute from now, about one minute and eight seconds. And that's when the, uh, excuse me, when the second stage will separate from the dragon trunk. The dragon trunk is the part of hardware where we are able to house the uh, cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space as well as the solar panels, which help power Dragon while it is on orbit. Again, that stage separation is now coming up in about 30 seconds. After stage separation, we will have nose cone deployment. Now that Dragon is in the vacuum of space, we're able to, we will be able to open the nose cone and expose that forward hatch, which is what is utilized to dock uh, autonomously with the International Space Station. And that nose cone does stay closed for the flight uphill to help protect all of the guidance, navigation, and control sensors. We are standing by for second stage separation. And there is separation. Dragon separation confirmed. And Dragon, this is your next director. Dragon captain is on. And Dragon, this is your launch director on Dragon. On behalf of the entire launch and recovery team, it was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this mission with you. And while October 3rd may belong to the Mean Girls, October 5th will forever belong to Crew 5. Godspeed endurance. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you so much to the Falcon team. Woo! That was a smooth ride up here. You got three rookies that are pretty happy to be floating in space right now, and one uh, veteran astronaut who's pretty happy to be back as well. Let's see what you got to say, Coochie. Uh, Falcon team, uh, you know, it was a smooth ride, and uh, I see all the three happy faces here it's back in zero G, and I appreciate all the help to give us a smooth ride and training, and thank you so much. JAXA の支援隊の皆さん、えー、非常にスムーズなあの打ち上げでした、えー、打ち上げご支援していただいた皆さん応援に駆けつけてくださった皆さんありがとうございましたこの調子でチームワークを持って頑張ります Thank you for your support アニア Thank you, Falcon 9 and our fellow agencies, Turos, Cosmos, NASA, and JAXA, and SpaceX exactly for giving us this opportunity. We so glad to do it together. And thank you for everybody, for all people who are with us. Thank you very much to all the agencies, Cosmos, NASA, JAXA, and, of course, SpaceX for the presentation of our news. We're happy to do everything we're doing now. And a big thank you to all the people who are with us right now. Thank you. Some really nice words there from the Crew 5 crew, as well as... And Dragon Falcon 9C, thanks for the words. Uh, we had a great ride. Have a good mission. We'll see you later. A wonderful Mean Girls reference there by Launch Director uh, Mark Soltis, and then we just heard from Chief Engineer Dan Alex. And we just heard our first Quindar tone. Indicating the crew is Alcohol in space. Dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Expected loss of signal, New Hampshire. Dragon copy. And Kate, it did look like we were getting our first views of that microgravity indicator. I did see that as well. <laughs> And we're getting views now of the crew on orbit, three of them for the first time ever. We saw some cheers, some high fives. Looks like they're feeling great. Hopefully we can see that zero G indicator float back into view and hopefully get a better shot of it. I couldn't quite tell what it was, although it kind of looked like it may have been an Einstein doll. Uh, but that's just kind of what it looked like from the, the backside. I think you're right, Kate. It looked like a baby Einstein to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So the next milestone that we're looking ahead towards is the nose cone opening. If you've just joined us, joined us, we had a successful liftoff uh, exactly 16 minutes ago of the Crew 5 mission. Uh, they had an on-time liftoff from Kennedy Space Center at noon Eastern time. They had a smooth ride up to orbit. The first stage landed successfully on our drone ship. Uh, just read the instructions and everything has been looking good so far. Uh, we are hoping to get another view on board Dragon uh, once we're able to get that camera back. Uh, but so far, uh, you know, everything leading up to this point in time, we got a shot there of the uh, MVAC engine, which is no longer firing. It is uh, coasting um, with that sec it's attached to the second stage which has been separated from Dragon. Um, yeah, so everything was super smooth this morning, uh, starting all the way back. Uh, I think we got here around T minus four hours and uh, super smooth countdown, beautiful day from Kennedy Space Center. It looked like a, a gorgeous view uh, from where Daryl and Bob were sitting. Uh, but yeah, we are uh, standing by for the nose cone opening. Now that the Dragon spacecraft is in space, we are able to- Target loss of signal, Finland. We are able to open up that uh, nose cone and expose the forward hatch, which is what is utilized to autonomously uh, dock with the International Space Station, but of course to protect that hardware that as well. As well as uh, protect the uh, guidance and navigation control hardware. Uh, we keep that nose cone closed during uh, launch preparations and during the ascent portion. So, uh, as you can see, saw there uh, momentarily, uh, Dragon is in space, and uh, the crew four, or excuse me, the crew five astronauts, all four of them are um, floating, uh, or they will be able to float soon. Uh, we're hoping to get another view of that zero G indicator once we're able to bring cabin. Uh, onboard cabin views uh, back to you of the Crew 5 crew. Uh, we always like to see what the uh what the zero-g gravity indicator is, as you saw earlier in the web webcast, uh, Bob actually brought uh, the zero-g indicator that he and Doug used on the Demo 2 mission, uh, a lovely sequin dinosaur, which I also have one at my desk, not the, uh, Bob obviously has the one that went to space, mine is a replica, uh, but we love seeing the zero-g indicators. It's a really nice way to connect uh, those of us on ground with the folks up in space. So as I said before, we are anticipating uh, nose cone deployment shortly. Uh, just you can do a quick check-in and oh, there we can see now uh, the nose cone, the hooks have been released and we see that nose cone moving with a pretty up close shot. We're continuing to see that nose cone open and acquisition of signal line. As we've mentioned, this does uncover a number of critical systems for the flight up to the space station that will be required for docking. There are six hooks that hold the nose cone in place during the launch and ascent portions. Those have begun to retract and the nose cone is beginning to swing open. The nose cone is about two thirds of the way open at this time, so we do expect it to be fully open here shortly. Shortly after nose cone deployment, the crew will be able to get their visors open and they'll be given the okay to get out of their suits and that will allow them to settle in for their ride to the International Space Station. It is about a 29 hour journey for the crew from launch to docking to the space station. But as you said, they'll be able to get out of their suits, get comfortable, get some rest and just enjoy being in the microgravity environment of space. Again, we have three first time flyers and one veteran on today's flight. But I'm sure it was an exciting moment. No matter how many times you've been to space, I can't imagine that it ever gets old. I would probably agree with that. Um, I would also imagine that the three first time space goers will have a brief period of acclimation to gravity. I know I certainly would. And I also 
recognize that my period probably wouldn't be very brief in order to get acclimated to that lack of gravity. Um, but yeah, this is something that um, the veteran um, astronauts on board station uh, are, you know, always happy to help uh, really introduce the, the new space goers uh, to the new environment. Absolutely. And we did also hear that there was good service section Draco checkouts that took place. We are standing by for that nose cone to be fully deployed, but it should be coming here momentarily. Dragon, we see a nominal nose cone opening, TCS and forward bulkhead Draco checkouts. Dragon copies. Next burn is a the upcoming phase burn per your displays. We see the phase burn in 28 minutes. Good readback. So you heard it there, the nose cone has fully been opened successfully. We had some good checkouts on the Draco thrusters, on the service section Draco thrusters rather. And we also had nominal forward bulkhead checkouts. That's right, and the astronauts should be getting the okay to doff or remove their suits uh, in about six or seven minutes. Uh, I would imagine that, um, as Sandra mentioned before, we do have three space newbies on board today. I would imagine that they would be pretty excited to get out of their seats. They've been in, uh, in these seats for a while. Uh, the crew ingressed hours ago, and uh, if I would imagine that the three folks and, uh, and even the veteran, everybody would be excited to get out and uh, be able to float around a little bit for the first time on this Crew-5 mission. Yes, absolutely. And you do see the crew working through some procedures there on the touch pads that they do have in front of them. They'll continue to have those available for them throughout their flight uphill. Again, this is going to be about a 29 hour launch to docking for Crew-5. It seems as though that zero G indicator may have floated out of view perhaps up above the crew displays. We can see that the visors are up. Dragon, SpaceX, environments are looking good for suit doffing. For today, we can leave the uh, camera configured for a little while longer, but at this time, you are go for 4.012 and 4.300. As a reminder, please stow the suits with the visors closed. I'll copy. Okay, Dragon copies. We are go for 4.012 and 4.300. We're going to keep the cameras configured, and when we stow the suits, we'll do it with the visors closed. Thanks. Good read back. At this time, you're also go to tell the world a little bit about that stowaway we saw shortly after second engine cutoff. So we're standing by from a few words, so standing by for a few words from the crew about that zero G indicator. And there it is. And no worries, repeating my last one there, I was going to uh, have you all talk a little bit about your zero G indicator, uh, but we can hold that off for the next uh, ground station pass here for Dubai. Uh, at this time, what I'll do is I'll take the cameras external for suit doffing, and then uh, you let me know when we're allowed to come back on board.
Okay, Dragon copies, so we'll let you know when you come back on with the cameras, and we're excited to talk about our uh, show right here. Okay, you're Dragon right. copies, and work. And it does sound like we are in a brief expected loss of signal with the crew. This does happen from time to time when we're in between our satellites, but we will have views and communication back with them here shortly. And we're looking forward to hearing their words on their stowaway and what that special meaning is for the crew. So with Crew 5 now successfully on orbit, let's head over to our counterparts at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Daryl it was spectacular to watch this launch from here in Hawthorne, but tell me, what was it like to see it on the ground? <laughs> it was amazing. First of all, we got an idyllic day right here uh, on the Space Coast. I mean, the temperatures are like, uh, you know, mid-70s. There's a cool breeze. Phenomenal launch. Bob, I want to get your thoughts. You've flown, you've watched. Uh, this was pretty perfect. No, this was just outstanding. It was picturesque, you know, with the blue sky, the blue background, uh, a beautiful day here in Florida. The only thing I, I, I wish was that I was there with them because that is the one place that is better to watch a launch from uh, than right here at the Kennedy Space Center is on board the rocket ship. I got to believe that. And uh, though we weren't on board, we did get to watch the views as we were going up and saw them land the booster, which, by the way, that booster also going to be SpaceX's and NASA's Crew 6 booster, so more the reuse, NASA taking advantage of that as well. Absolutely. Every chance that we get to reuse a, a capsule or reuse a booster kind of drives down costs and uh, pr increases the opportunity for more folks to fly in space. Now I'm headed out uh, to take a swim, right? Yeah, I mean, this <laughs> is just perfect out here. Bob, thank you for your thoughts. Um, and now we're going to move on. We've got an interview here with uh, Robin Gatens, the director of the International Space Station, who also joins us here. And you got to experience the launch from right here uh, outside the, the press site. And I uh, want to ask you, how did you enjoy it? Well, it's always exciting to see launch to the International Space Station. I've seen many, but uh, especially uh, to see an, a new international crew uh, headed to the International Space Station was, was very exciting. And of course, you, you nailed it. Beautiful day. Really glad we, we got this one off today. Absolutely. And they'll make that 29-hour transit to the space station. Uh, you're the director of the International Space Station, so I want to ask you, I, I heard there's a book coming out. Uh, that's, uh, I, there have been books before about the International Sp Space Station, but a new one's coming out. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's called Our Benefits to Humanity. Uh, it is a publication we have put out before, and we actually released it in July, so it's out. Uh, it's both in print format as well as online, so uh, people can just search on Benefits to, uh, for Humanity, International Space Station, and find that book. And it highlights uh, all of the wonderful research that's going on on the space station. This crew will be doing over 200 experiments during their time on the International Space Station, ranging from uh, medical uh, kinds of research that, that will help treat diseases and, and produce uh, new, new drugs uh, here on Earth, regenerative medicine. One day we might even uh, print uh, organs uh, for transplant on Earth. We have Earth science going on on space station, a number of climate instruments to help us um, understand Earth's climate. Uh, really exciting results. This is truly uh, what we call the decade of results on the International Space Station where uh, we're, we're, we're building on past uh, lessons and capabilities to just uh, compound the results that we're able to get out of the space station. And 235 investigations, 76 new ones, and you mentioned the decade, two decades, more than two decades, the yes. International Space Station has been operating. You mentioned some of the science that they're going to be doing. I'm wondering if you have a favorite that you've kind of identified, like, oh, I can't wait to find out the results of that. Well, I've been tracking a lot of them. Uh, I'm really excited about some of the medical uh, things. Uh, we're flying again a, uh, a payload by a company called Lamb Division, and they're producing uh, retinal implants that could be used to uh, help uh, patients with um, ocular degeneration. Uh, so that's really exciting. I'm excited about uh, what we're learning, um, you know, with respect to the climate. We've got brand new climate instruments up on board. Um, 
We've got companies learning how to make better products through their research on, uh, through the ISS uh, National Lab um, and their, their work on the space station. So um, I'm also excited about plant research going on on mm -hmm. space station. I think that's not only important for future exploration missions, but also to help us grow plants in harsh environments, small spaces here on Earth. And also NASA, while doing all of that, is continuing to work towards its ultimate goal of uh, getting to the moon, going back to the moon and sustaining our presence there. A lot of technology uh, at the station that works towards that end. We want to actually pause though for one second because we understand that one of the astronauts, uh, Josh Cassida, has a statement that he is going to uh, make. Uh, it, uh, it is relatively about uh, his zero G indicator, which if you saw in the coverage, it was a, I don't know if it was a baby Einstein, Bob, but it was a little Einstein. It definitely <laughs> looked like a small Einstein, but we'll listen to Josh and hear exactly the details. Let's listen in. Again, waiting for astronaut Josh Cassida with a special message. And Dragon, cameras are internal. Space next. Dragon copies, we are internal with the waistbands off and stand by for the cabin mic check. You see Koichi Wakata is out of his seat. Yeah, this is SpaceX Dragon from the cabin mic com check. And Koichi, I've got you five by five. How me? Mike, we have you loud and clear also. Great news, and we're also getting some great views inside the capsule here, so if you all want to get a chance to talk about your indicator, we'd all love to hear some. Absolutely, Mike. So, uh, a couple of years after we come up with his groundbreaking theory of special relativity, Albert Einstein, in his mind, still had a couple loose ends to tie up. While he was sitting in the patent office, because he wasn't famous yet, definitely should have been, he had what his happiest thought of his entire life. That thought was, a person in free fall doesn't feel their own weight. That thought, along with some others that he built upon, led to general relativity and our understanding of gravitation and curvature of space-time. We're experiencing Einstein's happiest thought continuously, like the International Space Station has been doing for over 20 years. On Crew 5, we call this little guy our free-fall indicator. We're here to tell you there's plenty of gravity up here. In fact, that's what's keeping us in orbit right now and preventing this trip on a Crew Dragon from being a one-way trip. A little bit like life. We live in the same world. We live in the same universe. Sometimes we experience it in a very different way from our neighbors. We can all keep that in mind. Hopefully we can all continue to do absolutely amazing things. Do it together. Well, that was excellent, Josh. We appreciate you all taking the chance to share with us some of those special words and some of the meaning to you all. I'll tell you, my crewmates are just happy that uh, we didn't break out a dry erase board and get into more detail. <laughs> we'll chat lensing later. Absolutely. A message from okay, at this time. astronaut Josh Cassida, the pilot of Crew 5, and his fellow astronauts and cosmonaut. 
floating in space high above the Earth as they head to the International Space Station with a special message about Albert Einstein, who is represented there floating around space as the zero-G indicator, but then also a nod to his uh, theory of relativity. E equals MC squared, I believe, Bob. <laughs> well, there are a lot of great things that Einstein was responsible for, and uh, I would just say that uh, maybe there are five folks uh, experiencing his uh, happiest thought on board uh, the Dragon capsule just right now. Absolutely, and NASA is looking to return humans to the surface of the moon, and this is part of it, going to the International Space Station. We mentioned some of the efforts in, uh, in going up there, and of course the science that's gonna be done by Crew-5, we're looking forward to that as well. Some final thoughts, uh, Bob, about the day today. Well, it was just a wonderful day, a chance for me to relive the launch experience with the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule. And I'm just super excited for the, uh, the Crew-5 uh, and little Einstein uh, on board and in free fall right now. A very special moment indeed. Before we wrap up, I want to send it over to Megan Cruz, who is with Deputy Administrator and former Space Shuttle astronaut, Pam Melroy. I am Pam and I have just been chatting about how wonderful of a day this was for a launch. Oh, it, it's a gorgeous day yes. here at the historic Kennedy Space Center. For me to see the next generation of launch vehicles launching to the space station was thrilling. And also the next generation of, of young explorers. You know, you and I were talking about a young boy here, guys, that bought a, a, a space <laughs> suit, an astronaut suit from downstairs at our, our, uh, our store and was wearing it around and running around. How cute was that to see him so excited? Well, I found it pretty cute to see the three rookies who were on the flight, as well as my very dear personal friend, Koichi Wakata, who I flew with in 2000 to the wow. space station. So I'm inspired by both the young and the experienced. And speak to me about that, That, like you said, you, you've flown on the space shuttle three times. Talk to me about that ascent, how it must feel as they're going up through the atmosphere. It's absolutely a remarkable experience. And I found myself thinking as I was looking at the, the schedule for this uh, rocket, how physics drives so much of what we do. So it's very similar in the timing of everything, uh, but uh, the space shuttle was a little bit of a wild ride, I have to say. It had a lot of vibration, particularly the first two minutes. Um, but, you know, it's a very different experience when you're here on the ground. Uh, it always brings tears to my eyes. I pray for the crew. When you're inside the vehicle, you're having a blast. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that they were having a blast. Uh, talk to me about why these commercial crew missions are so important. Well, they're really important to us for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the whole value that NASA brings uh, to the American people and in fact to humanity is around science, uh, uh, a strong science and technology posture for the country and inspiration. And uh, we see that all wrapped up in commercial crew because we see the ability to do more science on orbit yes. because we can carry more crew members. We see the advancements that have been made through NASA investments in commercial crew and commercial cargo that are lifting our entire space industry. And of course, there's nothing better than seeing an astronaut fly to space for inspiration. Sure, and what's next for NASA? You know, right behind us, we have the vehicle assembly building. Inside is NASA's Artemis I rocket. Are you excited for that? Oh, I'm, I'm very excited. I'll tell you, it's a big deal when a new rocket flies for the first time. And uh, we have learned a lot. We, we have a lot to learn, just like I was a test pilot. So when we flew airplanes, uh, we never actually launched the first try. Usually we just taxied down the runway. <laughs> so we've, we've taken her out to the runway a couple of times now, and we've learned a lot. And I cannot wait to see the most powerful rocket in the world launch going to the moon. Yeah, we're doing a lot of great stuff here, and we're so happy to bring viewers on the ride with us, right? You bet. <laughs> That's the whole idea. NASA shares and inspires. Perfect. Pam, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Guys, we're going to send it back to you for the last time today. Thank you very much, Megan. Great job out there. Appreciate it. And Nicole, Josh, and Koichi and Anna are now on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And of course, NASA TV will stay on the air for continuous live coverage along Crew-5's entire ride to station. Meanwhile, SpaceX's YouTube channel will join live coverage starting at roughly two hours prior to docking. And though our coverage here at Kennedy is coming to a close. We will turn it over to the team in Houston to take us through the next phases of the Crew-5 mission all the way through the arrival at the International Space Station. For those of you watching online on NASA's YouTube, make sure you take a look at the description below. You'll see the video link there and 
You'll find that for Crew 5 Coast Phase. Live coverage will continue at that link shortly. You can see it at the bottom of your screen. Pull that up for you. If you're watching on NASA TV, you won't notice a thing, and coverage will continue. So a post-launch news conference is scheduled for 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on NASA TV. And you can find mission updates on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at nasa.gov, including timing on any potential live tours of Dragon uh, Endurance during the trip to station. Now, before we sign off from Kennedy, I want to thank my partner and co-host, Bob Bankin for being on the launch broadcast, sharing your incredible insight and experiences. Bob, I really enjoyed listening to you today. Thank you so much to you and to Megan, your wife, who helped us with Crew 4. Uh, we look forward uh, to hearing more from uh, your family, as well as uh, maybe seeing Theo on a, on a future <laughs> launch broadcast. Well, well thank you, Daryl. I, I very much appreciate that. And, of course, thank you to my wife and uh, my son and our dog, Shadow, for joining us uh, for a short period of time during the during today's broadcast. And uh, again, I just want to echo uh, Deputy Administrator Pam Morroy's words with, uh, it's been an exciting year. Uh, the Crew 5 folks are, are just getting started on their excitement for the year, if you will, on their way to the space station right now. But we've got an Artemis uh, 1 rocket over there, the SLS in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Looking forward to seeing that back out on the pad and uh, getting her launched later this year. Coming to a launch pad soon, mid-November. We all hope, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well immensely. Huge thanks to all of our guests for joining us today, and thank you to all of you for watching. Here now are the highlights from the journey we took today, and just a reminder from here at the Kennedy Space Center to keep looking up. So they're getting suited up inside that historic suit-up room, everything going smoothly, And there they are, the astronauts of Crew-5 taking their first steps outside.
sequence start. Six, five, four. I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Godspeed, John Glenn. Welcome to Mission Control Houston. I'm NASA Shaniqua Vereen, and we are live in the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Just about 50 minutes ago, we had a successful launch of NASA's SpaceX Crew-5 mission to the International Space Station from the Kennedy Space Center at Launch Complex 39A in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Crew-5 will have about a 29-hour flight to the space station. Crew-5 lead flight director Greg Whitney, who led integrated NASA and SpaceX operations teams and planning for this mission is currently leading teams here in Mission Control and will be back later tomorrow for Dragon's approach and docking. Crew 5 astronauts consist of NASA astronaut and Dragon commander Nicole Mann, NASA astronaut and Dragon pilot Josh Cassida, mission specialist JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata, and Russian cosmonaut Anna Kikina. Expedition 68 is currently aboard the International Space Station, including the Crew 4 astronauts, NASA's Chell Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and the current station commander and European Space Agency astronaut, Samantha Christopheretti. They arrived back in April of 2022 and are set to come home next week. Also aboard the station is NASA astronaut Frank Rubio and Roscosmos cosmonauts, Serge Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Patelin of Ross Cosmos, who recently arrived to the space station aboard a Soyuz spacecraft. With the addition of Crew-5, we'll have 11 people aboard the station for a short period of time. Currently attached are four spacecrafts, including the SpaceX Crew Dragon Freedom, which brought up the Crew-4 astronauts, a Russian Soyuz MS-22, cruise ship and Progress 80 and 81 resupply ships. Crew 5 is not the only thing headed to station. That's right, we have critical science and investigations headed up with the crew. Here are some details on the science the crew will work on on their mission. Astronauts experience changes in their cardiovascular, respiratory, and muscul musculoskeletal systems during spaceflight. These changes could pose a challenge on future long-duration missions, particularly those where crews encounter different levels of gravity and have minimal direct medical support. Cardio Breath, a Canadian space agency, Investigation flying with the crew examines deconditioning of the cardiorespiratory system and how it affects the control of blood pressure. Crew members will wear a custom fitted biomonitor shirt that tracks heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, and activity level before, during, and after exercise. Results are then compared to measurements taken before and after, after the astronauts' missions. These findings could provide insight into how blood pressure control adapts and help researchers develop a ways, develop ways to keep astronauts healthier in space.
Dragon, burn complete, nominal burn. Next burn is the phase burn per your displays in approximately 20 hours. And copies, we see that burn coming up in 20 hours. Try to contain your excitement just for a little while longer. And when able, uh, we do have some words for Josh to uh, plan or to talk through some of the actions we wanted to take on his suit. So no hurry on that one, but just when ready, uh, report when you're ready to copy. Good, Mike. We're ready to copy. Okay, Josh, I've got four items here that we're looking uh, for your eyes on. So I'll kind of go through the first two first and then the second two because the first two are a little bit connected and then the last two will be pretty straightforward. But uh, first item that I have is that what we'd like you to do is remove the back, sorry, the middle seat foam of your seat and then verify that the seat side umbilical connection is secure by pressing firmly downwards directly above both latches. That's one firm push above each latch and let us know if you hear any clicks or tactile feedback. How copy. Hey, Mike, I copy that uh, step one is going to be to take out the uh, middle foam of my seat and, and make sure that that umbilical seat is connected. I'll be doing that by pushing above the latches and see if I can even hear them uh, click into place. That's correct, and that's going to be, the, for the above, it's going to be kind of directly into the seat itself. Okay, after that, the second action that we have is that we're requesting that you then lightly pull the umbilical in the opposite direction of which way you'd be pushing in step one. The goal here is to see if pulling away is causing the latches to become loose. How copy. Okay, copy. After step one, I will uh, pull away uh, from the uh, the connection and see if that makes the latches come loose. Yep, and just for full clarification, there we're looking for just a light pull there, nothing nothing too forceful. Okay, and we just finished up the handover over there, but if you're ready uh, for item number three, I'm ready to report. Copy on items three and four. Okay, item number three is to inspect for any thawed around the inflatable visor seal, taking extra care around that polycarbonate portion of the visor. Dragon copies, uh, step three will be inspecting that inflatable visor seal, and I'll uh, watch out for that polycarpet. Good readback. And then the last is to uh, take one inspection of the trap door on the suit side QD and just look for any potential FOD on that side of the suit. I'll copy. In the copy on step four, uh, I will go ahead and uh, check the trap door on the QD side and just see if there's any thought in there on my suit. Good read back. Okay, 
Dragon copies all four of those steps. We'll put those into work. We'll report back in uh, seven minutes and let you know uh, how they went. And then uh, can we get big picture words on the plan after that? Uh, we're going to be uh, doing another suit leak check here before the end of the workday, which we're happy to do. Uh, or do you want to, uh, to push that off? Great question. Uh, overall, we are not recommending another leak check at this time. We're just uh, getting a little bit more insight into the current status, knowing that we'll have the leak check for approach is going to be our first time stepping back into uh, any kind of suited activities here. Uh, that, that may change if we discover out something on here, but right now we're not planning on having you all re-perform a leak check today. Happy. Uh, we'll knock out these four, and uh, we're not planning another leak check actually until we uh, start kicking off the rendezvous, if that's correct. That's a good readback. Thanks a lot, Mike. We appreciate it. If you're just joining us, we're doing live coverage of the SpaceX, the NASA SpaceX Crew-5 mission. Their launch to the International Space Station was successful this morning around 11 a.m. CT, 12 noon Eastern Time. Currently on your screen is Hawthorne Mission Control, MCCX on your left, and International Space Station Flight Control Room here at Mission Control Houston on the right where teams are still in contact with the crew. You just heard the core in SpaceX's mission control speaking to Josh Cassida as they went over a suit leak check, just checking preemptively because the crew will be off duty and they will not be checking again until suits are put back on upon rendezvous and approach for docking tomorrow. You'll hear calls throughout today's coverage from Dragon to Ground to the crew as they come up from the core in MCCX. And Dragon, no response required. Just a reminder that the off-duty period is starting in approximately 30 minutes. You'll be confirming your sleep schedule with flight surgeons in an upcoming PMC. And you just heard the core to the crew reminding them that they are off duty and that's 12.30 Central Time, 1.30 Eastern Time. So just about 29 minutes from now, the crew will be off duty and we may not hear um, calls any longer to the crew, but we will return and be on duty about two and a half hours before docking, currently scheduled for 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Speaking of docking, there's been a lot of preparations that have taken place to prepare the orbiting lab for Crew-5's arrival. In the days leading up to docking, the crew moved stowage around to make sure the docking hatchways were clear and supplies were ready for Crew-5.
the afternoon of docking, the station crew will set up laptops that will allow them to monitor Dragon's approach. These tools will be monitored and mirrored down to the ground for flight controllers to see as well. NASA astronaut Chell Lindgren will be primed for the lead for monitoring Dragon's approach. Well, he'll be backed by NASA's Bob Hines. Other prep will continue before the crew arrives to the station, which includes cleaning Node 2 or the Harmony module in preparation for Crew 5's arrival and installing crew alternate sleep accommodations or CASAs to provide additional crew quarters on board. With 11 people and only seven permanent crew quarters on the International Space Station, some of the crew will also sleep inside their Dragon spacecrafts. One crew member will sleep inside a Freedom while another will sleep inside Endurance once it's docked, with the remaining staking out temporary campout locations, likely in the station's Kiba module or the U.S. airlock. As approach and docking continues, the crew has about a 29-hour approach and rendezvous phase for, for the crew to arrive at the International Space Station. Flight controllers here on the ground in Mission Control Houston will also begin further preparations. Around three hours prior to docking, flight controllers will begin to feather the ISS solar arrays. This is a multi-step process that is spaced spaced out until Dragon is on the docking axis. Both solar alpha rotary joints will be parked and locked. Four beta gimbal assemblies, or BGAs, will be parked, with two of those also being latched. The other four BGAs will continue to track the sun, continuing to provide power to the International Space Station. This configuration is designed to protect the arrays from thruster trails or plumes as Dragon approaches. Around 1.5 hours to docking, we will hand over station attitude control from U.S. gyroscopes to Russian thruster, thrusters. This is so station can hold finer attitude control while Dragon approaches. Once soft dock is complete, the docking ring retraction complete, we will hand over attitude control back to the U.S. gyroscopes so that thrusters are not firing. SpaceX for PMC. Dragon, uh, uh, we would like to get out of the, uh, the suit now, so um, for PMC, could you wait for 10 minutes? Not a problem. We have a lot of window for the PMC. Just let us know when you'd like to take it. Okay, yeah, we'll get back with you. Thank you. And that was a call from the Corps to the crew. Koichi Wakata responded. The SpaceX Dragon crew would like to doff their suits before having a PMC or a private medical conference. This is standard procedure for any approach and docking in a spacecraft. And the crew is doing fine. They will let the Corps know when they are ready for those PMCs.
If you're just joining us, you're watching live coverage of NASA SpaceX Crew-5 mission to the International Space Station. The SpaceX Dragon spacecraft carrying NASA astronauts Nicole Mann, Dragon Commander Josh Cassada, Dragon Pilot and Mission Specialist JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata and Russ Cosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina are on their way to the International Space Station and they have successfully reached orbit. They're in for a tw about a 29-hour rendezvous until they approach and dock to the International Space Station. We're expecting docking to commence around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. So far as the crew has reached orbit, they have had a successful nose cone deploy, a successful 11 minute phase burn, and are looking for the next burn to be 20 hours from now, and that's a phase adjust burn. Again, that will happen a couple hours before approach and docking to the International Space Station. You won't see any cabin views for now. You currently have views of MCCX, that's the SpaceX Mission Control Room in Hawthorne, California on the left. And you see the International Space Station Flight Control Room or Mission Control Houston on your right. The crews are currently doffing their spacesuits or taking off their spacesuits and they will then have a private medical conference with flight surgeons here on the ground. The crew will go into an off-duty status around 12.30 Central Time, 1.30 Eastern Time, which means we won't hear or see, see them until we're in, the, in a closer approach and docking maneuver.
You're looking live at Mission Control Houston, the International Space Station Flight Control Room, where we just had a successful launch at 11 a.m. Central Time of NASA's crew, NASA SpaceX Crew 5 mission. The crew successfully launched and are now in orbit, heading towards the International Space Station. Dragon had a successful separation and nose cone deploy. It now begins what's called an activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. During this phase, Dragon is configured for an on-orbit operations. The phase begins after separation from Falcon 9 and ends with the completion of the final co-elliptic burn. The initial orbit that was met today was 190 kilometers by 210 kilometers, with those values representing the perigee and apogee of the orbit, or the lowest and highest point over the Earth. That means that the orbit isn't a perfect circle, but more like a slight ellipse. Over the course of the next 28 and a half hours or so, Dragon will execute a series of burns, the next not being for 20 hours post that phase burn that they had after coming into orbit, but these burns will then gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the station. There are five major burns or firings of those Draco thrusters on Dragon that will bring the spacecraft close to station before they begin a final approach maneuver. The first major burn, which was the phase burn, is performed at the first apogee. We had that, it was successful had a nominal burn of 11 minutes, and that raised Dragon's perigee and put Dragon into a higher altitude. The next burn, which is based on the orbital data, is gonna be the boost burn, which raises Dragon's orbit until its orbit reaches an altitude just 10 kilometers lower than the space station. Followed soon after by the close co-elliptic burn, to place Dragon on an orbit. SpaceX Dragon on Dragon to ground for suit three suit. Go ahead, Josh. I'm ready to copy. Okay, Mike. I'm going to go in reverse direction here, if you don't mind. Uh, check the QD uh, connection on the outside of the suit, and that trap door was clear of any fod. Also inspected the visor seal. Um, I did find uh, no damage to the seal at all, but I did find a hair uh, that was on the top of the seal. All I know is it wasn't Koichi's, um, but I'm pretty sure that wasn't the problem. Um, and then moving up to the QD connection there on the seat. Step two, when I pulled away, uh, it did not uh, did not cause the latches to uh, to disconnect. But uh, I know you're waiting for it number one that actually worked uh, pushed uh, on the uh, on the connector and found that the bottom latch uh, clicked into place so when I did that very first step I think I found the uh, source of our problem okay copy that so just running through the reverse list here the QD on the suit side was clear of FOD. The visor seal did not have any damage, but you did find a hair. Koichi has been exonerated. The QD on the seat, you pulled away and no latches disconnected. And then when you did the QD push, the bottom latch closer to the seat bottom did click into place. You got it, Mike. That makes me feel pretty good. How do you feel about it? We're feeling pretty good about it as well. We'll talk about that here more on the ground and see if there's any further actions or troubleshooting we want to take. But for now, uh, we're good to call it for, for troubleshooting there. So thank you for your effort and investigation. No problem at all. We really appreciate you guys uh, putting your heads together and coming up with a plan to uh, figure out what might have happened. And uh, when you guys are ready, we're ready for that uh, initial PMC. Okay, copy that. Stand by one. We'll work the PMC and uh, get that along shortly.
And you just heard NASA astronaut Josh Cassida talking to the SpaceX core Michael Blasco about a suit leak check that happened a little earlier on, checking the umbilical for FOD or that foreign object debris. Josh did confirm that there was a loose latch and it has now been rectified. The crew is now going to talk to a uh, flight surgeon here on the ground for a private medical conference. You will not hear this conference. It is private and the crew, this is standard procedure for the crew. You're seeing live inside Mesh Control at SpaceX, Hawthorne, California.
Hello, and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we just watched a beautiful Crew-5 launch on the most beautiful Florida afternoon. I'm Megan Cruz with NASA Communications, and you are watching the post-launch news conference for today's mission. So let's jump right into it. We have first Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator, Space Operations Mission Directorate here at NASA headquarters. Steve Stitch, Manager, Commercial Crew Program, NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Joel Montalbano, Manager, International Space Station Program at NASA Johnson. Also, Sarah Walker, Director, Dragon Mission Management SpaceX. Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General, JAXA's Human Spaceflight Technology Directorate. And Sergey Krikalov, Executive Director, Human Spaceflight Programs, Roscosmos. Thank you all for being here. Now we're going to start with some opening remarks from each of them who I just introduced, and then we'll take questions from reporters. So, Kathy, go ahead. Oh, wow, what a beautiful launch. Um, you know, it was nice to not be fighting the weather as we were heading into the count. And so, um, actually, we're all sitting there, and things were looking really smooth, and I don't even think we had the weather up <laughs> in the fire room four. So, um, that, was, that was really enjoyable. But I think it was wonderful to see just how excited Nicole and Josh and Anna and our seasoned veteran, veteran Koichi were as they got on orbit. I mean, just once again experiencing um, at being in space. And, uh, and for us, it's always great to see that launch go through and see the spacecraft um, operating safely. Um, finally, you know, these are real human endeavors. and. There was a team here that had to recover from the hurricane last week, get back, get the Kennedy Space Center back open, get things cleaned up, get us ready to go. And, and our, really, our, the fact that we're here today is a testimony to all that work that that team did. So I would really like to thank all the folks that worked so hard and the SpaceX and NASA team that just carefully got us prepared for today. And now I'll turn it over to Steve Stitch. Yeah, th thanks, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here today. And as Kathy said, uh, I guess I'm super excited uh, with the launch today. The weather couldn't have been better here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we didn't have to look at any weather on a, a monitor. We could just look out the window and see a beautiful <laughs> blue sky. And really, it was that way along the ground track as well. You know, we talked about uh, the uh, abort winds at the staging location, and those were within limits today. So we. At our weather briefing at six hours prior to launch, we decided to go press into the countdown. What a great decision that was. Uh, the team did a phenomenal job uh, working through the issues out of the launch readiness review. SpaceX recovered the drone ship to just read the instruction. That was ready. You saw the booster land perfectly on that. We replaced an actuator on engine three, and that worked out great. Check that out. And then we got the fire suppression, a small leak fixed, and then we're ready to go fly. Uh, the vehicle is doing great on orbit. Uh, Dragon is, is doing well. Nose cone was open. Thrusters are doing great. All the systems are working fine. Um, you could see Nicole and uh, Josh and Anna and Koichi. They are all smiles and happy to be on, in space. They were so excited today. It's great to see them on orbit. And now we're going to focus the next uh, 29 hours from launch to get them docked. And that docking time is 4.57 PM tomorrow afternoon Eastern. And so we'll really turn our attention to that phase of the flight. We're excited about the launch. We're excited Dragon's doing well, but we'll focus on docking and getting them safely docked to the space station. And now I'll turn it over to the space station program manager, Joel Montabano. Hey, thank you, Steve, and thank you guys for, for being here today and for those who are dialing in. Just an outstanding launch, as you've already heard, and it is awesome to have four new space flyers on their way to the International Space Station. Uh, these guys, as Steve said, will dock um, just before 5 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. A hatch opening will be about 90 minutes later. It's just a little past 90 minutes for a hatch opening. Uh, they'll stay docked about 150 days. In 150 days, we'll have them doing human research experiments. We'll have them doing technology development. That's going to help us go past low Earth orbit and do further exploration, as well as they'll do some of our commercialization activities. As far as the handover between Crew 4 and Crew 5, it'll be uh, about five days. Uh, once the vehicle gets docked, we'll start working the details with uh, the commercial crew program and SpaceX on the, you know, the actual weather, but uh, we have a, a, good, um, a good handful of days of docked ops with the team. 
And with that, uh, let me congratulate and thank our international partners, the Commercial Crew Program, and the SpaceX teams. Just a fantastic day to, to be in human spaceflight. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Joel. I have very similar things to say as my colleagues and friends up here today, so maybe I'll, I'll keep it short. But yeah, it was an incredible day to launch Dragon and, and Crew-5 to the space station. We are, we're so excited to see uh, Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna uh, start their mission on board the, the orbiting laboratory. Uh, so uh, someone reminded me as I was walking in here today that this mission actually marks 30 humans that SpaceX has sent to space. It, my life flashed before me kind of on, on hyperdrive, right? It, it feels like yesterday that Bob and Doug were driving up to the pad. That was May 2020, um, the first humans that SpaceX had the privilege of, of launching, and here we are, um, the 30, 30 humans in space. Um, today, Falcon 9 launched Dragon into a nominal insertion orbit. That was about an hour and a half ago. And, uh, and then that first stage booster, is, as Steve said, returned to just read the instructions, our drone ship, which was stationed out in the Atlantic Ocean. It was actually, a, happened to be a first flight booster, uh, so it will be returning to shore soon for many more flights ahead, hopefully, in the near future. Meanwhile, on orbit, Dragon has completed its initial on-orbit checkouts, and um, soon it will start performing a series of burns that will help it catch up with the International Space Station for docking tomorrow. It's about a 29-hour flight. Uh, once safely docked, my team's focus is going to be fully on bringing the crew four uh, t uh, crew home safely to their friends and family in about a week's time after that. So uh, we'll continue to watch the weather. The, the vehicle that is on board supporting the crew four mission is healthy, and uh, we'll just we'll watch for those conditions to safely bring the, uh, the crew home and uh, safe for our recovery teams as well. So thanks to the 45th Space Delta for enabling this launch today. Thank you especially to NASA and JAXA and Roscosmos for um, collaborating on, on this. Uh, how incredible, actually, that I have three nation space agencies here um, at the table representing this mission, um, a huge partnership and collaboration. So thank you for, thank you for your partnership. Sasaki-san, yeah, would you like you. to give okay. some words? Thank you. Introduction. Uh, I'm Hiro Sasaki, Vice President of JAXA, in charge of the human space flight and space exploration. Uh, this is a sad time to see uh, Crew Dragon's launch, but every time is very beautiful. <laughs> and on behalf of JAXA, uh, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to every single colleagues uh, who has been devoted to the launch while facing the tough time under the hurricanes. Uh, but the mission is still going on, but uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate all of you on the successful launch. And I'm sure that Crew 5 mission is a symbol of a strong international partnership. And uh, its importance is recognized, especially in the uh, tough time we are facing now. I do believe that the international partnership has been and will continue to be a key to uh, bring the, us a variety of benefit um, um, unavailable of the, the ISS. Uh, this is a fifth flight uh, for Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata. Uh, he has uh, rich uh, experience in space, and I hope he transfers his experience to, to his uh, colleague astronaut and create uh, fr fruitful outcomes in the ISS with them, which are indispensable to our life on Earth and future exploration. I'm confident that Japan will continue to take a significant role in the human uh, endeavor by making the best use of the, our expertise and open new era with international partners. Once again, congratulations on the successful launch. I'd like to uh, pass uh, Sergei uh, Kurikarev, uh, Russian colleague. Thank you very much. Uh, it's difficult to add something uh, to what was already said. Um, I just want to say that we start new phase of our cooperation, start to do this exchange flight, because uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, American crew member went on Russian Soyuz spacecraft on, on the station, and now uh, Russian cosmonaut Anna Kikina is a member of this crew, and they are going to be on the station very soon and join together and uh, keep working together. Uh, but starting that we uh, start new phase, I want to mention that we just continue what was started many years ago in 1975 when Apollo Soyuz crew uh, worked together and um, now we continue our cooperation. And also I want to say that uh, of course we celebrate a successful launch but for the crew it's just beginning of the mission. Uh, they need to dock tomorrow and then they have 
many days of uh, very interesting uh, phase of their flight, uh, new experiments, and I hope that uh, all this flight would be successful. I would like to wish uh, for the crew uh, successful flight and uh, good mission. Thank you, everyone, for those opening remarks. We'll get into the questions now. We have some reporters here in the room, but also we have some reporters over the phone. If you are on the phone and want to get into the question queue, don't forget to hit star one. And to get to as many of you guys as possible, please ask one question. Let us know who you'd like to answer that question, and then we'll try to go around to see if anybody else has some other questions. So I saw the first hand over here. Oh, right over here, actually, right behind you. She yeah. doesn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be fair. <laughs> well, good afternoon. I'm Tom Costello with NBC News. Again, congratulations on yet another uh, great launch. Uh, to uh, Sergey from the Russian Space Agency, I know you addressed this a few days ago, but in this setting, uh, now that we have a television camera, how committed is Russia to this international cooperation, to the space station, and how long will you be a partner with the United States, with Japan, with Canada, with the international partners in this program? Uh, this is a two question in your question. Uh, basically, for how long, it depends on many uh, things, and uh, technical things would be probably primary. Uh, but uh, talking about cooperation, I think we start to cooperate, as I said, uh, many years ago, more than 40 years ago, and we will continue our cooperation uh, as long as I can imagine. Okay, and then right here. <laughs> yes, right here. I am Jim Siegel. I'm with nasatech.net. Congratulations to all of you and your teams for a great launch uh, here today. Uh, I'm, uh, I believe I have a question for Sarah. Uh, I believe that uh, Crew 4 had a uh, investigation uh, concerning artificial retinas and I'm interested in whether uh, uh, that um, investigation is going to come back with crew 4 or if it's going to stay on the uh, on the space station for additional work thank you yeah let me let me take a run at that um, that is true we did do the, the retina experiment and, and the cool thing about that is the results of that are going to help restore sight um, the goal is that you take that information you use and then you make a, a step closer to restoring sight for people that have lost it. Um, I believe we returned some of that work on a, on a cargo spacecraft. I thought SpaceX 25 returned some of that, but let me go verify that and uh, we'll close the loop with you on that. Okay, thank you. I saw Marsha's hand here on the fir first row. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Sergey. Um, how does it feel for you being back here launching Cosmonauts again from Kennedy Space Center? You were the first, after all. And um, also, for your staff in Moscow, has the war been a distraction for them? Um, the longer it goes, do you worry about them being distracted or having um, their work impacted by what's going on around them? Thank you. Uh, crew which is flying now in space which just launched uh, in space tomorrow they have a pretty tight schedule they have a lot of assignment and they will uh, do what they're supposed to do they were trained for that so i hope uh, destruction uh, from what is going on the ground would be minimum because we are trying to focus on uh, scientific task on engineering task and uh, crew will do what what they're supposed to do as, as for me, as I said, I was very pleased to be here again. I remember being here a long time ago when we uh, start previous phase of our cooperation, when we start to do our uh, shuttle missions and then Mir shuttle program and then uh, construction of uh, International Space Station. So for me, I'm, I'm very glad to see all friends, uh, all colleagues, and. Uh, as I said, I hope we will cooperate together the way it was started in 1975. I'm, I didn't mean the crew being distracted. I meant flight controllers. Your, your, your team in Moscow, are they being distracted by the ongoing war in Ukraine and what's going they, on? They also do what, uh, what they're supposed to do. They, they do their duty. And actually, we have a team not only uh, in Moscow, but also in Houston. Uh, we have a uh, group of Russians uh, who is in Russian mission control. We have a group of Americans who is in 
a group of Americans in uh, mission control in Moscow and group of Russians in mission control in Houston. So this gr uh, group is very focused on the do what they're supposed to do. Thank you. I saw the, a hand right there, yeah? Second row on this side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sergey Imatov, Russian TASS News Agency. Well, first of all, congratulations, everyone, on today's launch. That was amazing. And I guess my question is for Steve Mudd, maybe Joel or Katie will add something up. So um, I was curious about your take about uh, the meaning of today's launch, uh, first uh, integrated crew launch on the U.S. soil. Um, what does it mean for the future of Russia and U.S. Uh, cooperation? And maybe do you have... Uh, any plans to extend the agreement uh, after 2024? Thank you. I'll take the first part and then I'll let Joel talk about the agreement. But, uh, you know, I was very excited today to have another international partner fly on our commercial crew vehicles. It was great to see Anna fly. It's great to see Sergey again here. I got to work with Sergey a long time ago in, in Shuttle Mirror, so it was neat seeing that colleague. And we're excited about continuing to fly international partner astronauts. Uh, we take these missions very Seriously, each one is a little different, and you know, I was sort of thinking and reflecting back. This is now our sixth crewed launch in just a little over uh, two and a half years, and each is different. But then when we go about the preparation, it, it's the same for every flight. I think an example of that preparation was today. I don't know if you were following when we were closing the hatch, but uh, we take some closeout pictures of the hatch, of the seals around the hatch, and the team at Hawthorne saw one human hair on that hatch seal and spotted it very quickly, said reopen the hatch and let's get that hair off and make sure it was good. So that's what our teams are doing on the NASA side here at Kennedy, uh, at JSC, in partnership with, the, uh, with uh, SpaceX. And so it's a great team effort. And uh, we're excited to continue to fly more and more uh, cosmonauts and Japanese astronauts and ESA and our U.S. astronauts on our program. You know, from a cooperation standpoint, Sergey mentioned it a little earlier, you know, we've been cooperating um, with uh, the Russian Space Agency since the Apollo Soyuz. And, and the cool thing is General Stafford was at today's launch. He was in the OSB2 with us. And, um, and General Stafford has been, you know, he uh, leads the U uh, U.S. Uh, Review Commission that reviews the space station program on a regular basis, and he's been part of this process. Um, so it was good to see that. As far as future work, I think everybody's well aware we signed an agreement with Roscosmos for one flight this year, one flight next year, and one flight in 24. Um, that's for all SpaceX missions. Uh, once uh, Boeing gets up and running, our plan is to continue this uh, cooperation on the Boeing missions. As we extend Space Station, get partner across the board agreement to extend past 24, we would also extend the agreement as our goal. Thank you, Stitch and Joel. We're going to pause in the room real quick and take a caller on the phone. We have Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Hi, thank you, and congratulations on another beautiful launch. Uh, for Mr. Krikalev, a uh, follow-up from my question the other evening. In your recent comments, including today and in the comments by Mr. Borsov the other day, it seems like you're both making a real effort to smooth over relations with NASA and to demonstrate that you're very committed to the partnership. And I can't help but notice how this stands in stark contrast to the way Mr. Rogozin spark, uh, spoke of the partnership when he was head of Roscosmos. And I wonder if it's part of a concerted effort to ease the tensions that arose under him and to turn down the temperature a bit. Thanks very much. Answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another caller on the phone. That's Joey Roulette from Reuters. Hey, thank you. Um, I had a question for Mr. Krikalev. Um, beyond this crew exchange agreement Russia has with NASA, um, do, do you guys at Roscosmos have any other agreements with other countries to fly non-Russian astronauts on Soyuz? Um, and if, if not, are you guys in talks with those countries uh, to lock in such an agreement? Thanks. Uh, so it's to me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, kind of preset agreement and uh, nothing new is happening. We just recently we flew UAE astronaut on uh, Soyuz spacecraft and we have uh, tourists flying on the station and we have special procedure uh, every time we fly non-partner uh, crew member uh, on board Soyuz or American vehicle we need to have a full agreement from our international partners uh, so we did it for as I said for UAE cosmonaut 
uh, and in the future we, we are planning to get new uh, new country new programs new agencies involved in space flights and we j just follow procedure that was set a while ago and we just agree with each other for every next step okay back here in the room ken i remember you raise your hand first row right here in the blue Hi, thank you, Ken Kramer, for Space Up Close, and congratulations to all of you again on a beautiful launch, yeah, especially after the hurricane. Um, so, Sergey, let me ask you a question. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to have you here. Um, you, you're a hero to, to all the people that love space. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to ask you about your perspective on the ISS, since you were the first one on the first mission. It's grown tremendously. Tell us about your expectations for the ISS. Ha has it met them? Has it exceeded them? What, what do you hope the ISS will lead to in the future? Um, yeah, that's a complicated question, and uh, probably the big story behind of uh, what was planned initially, what we are going to do in the future, and uh, f I can just remind you that when we uh, just started this program, every module was built uh, in order to fly for 15 years. We actually exceed this 15 years uh, time mark long time ago, and station was uh, um, extended a uh, couple times. Right now we have agreement uh, to fly together up to 2024. Uh, we already talk with our uh, international partners and we talk with our specialists in Russia looking through technical capability of station to fly and uh, we understand that it makes sense to keep flying because this uh, uh, excellent infrastructure that built in space can be used for for humanity f uh, even more than we uh, were initially planned uh, i think from very beginning we understood that station is very valuable uh, to do science on in space on low earth orbit but also we understand that station is test bed for future flights uh, for uh, flying uh, more exciting mission to fly beyond low earth orbit and uh, we can test a lot of equipment a lot of procedures a lot of uh, methods of flying uh, working on international space station so that's what we are keep keeping now we will, we are going to keep it in future and uh, we will see how long station will be able to fly and i think main limitation would be technical technical reason thank you and there is a question back here on this side of the room last row hi aaron cooper with cnn um, i understand that soyuz has been able to do some fast track uh, docking attempts is um, why hasn't that been tried uh, with the Dragon missions? And is there thought in the future of doing kind of expedited or fast, uh, faster trips up to ISS? Yeah, I mean, the, the missions are not very long on the order of a day, um, plus or minus a, a few hours here and there. Um, and it really just depends on the orbital mechanics of when we, um, what day we launch and where the space station is and uh, how many burns to catch up. But uh, I, I think, Joel, maybe you could speak to this, but I think uh, a day or less is um, a, a, a nice short mission to get up to space station and um and, and then when you constrain your launch to like hours you do have to constrain the launch date and so uh, having the the one day gives us helps us maximize the opportunities and oh, yeah, Steve. yeah we we could have launched right anytime this week we had a launch opportunity tomorrow which was a little longer run to do 10 more hours about a 38 and a half hours to dock so what we have chosen to do is sort of optimize um, any time launch, I would say, and have as many opportunities as possible. Some of those are as short as about 16 hours to dock. Some of those are a little longer, like the one we're taking today. And so what we've chosen to do is sort of optimize any day launch just to handle the weather situation here at the Kennedy Space Center, our launch environment, which is lots of launches on the range, and then also abort weather, which we have some criteria up the coast. And so we've chosen to do that versus sort of optimize the Dragon to launch, you know, in a couple orbits, which it could feasibly do that if we chose to do so. And I believe I saw one last hand in the room. Yep, can we just have him in the front row? Yeah, hi, John McGill with Windat Cable. This question's for Sarah. Uh, we've been getting used to previously flown boosters. So how does a new uh, booster differ uh, in your preparation? Yeah, uh, there's, there's not difference in the 
the checks that we do in pre preparing for the uh, for the launch and certifying the booster. Um, we have a production facility in Hawthorne in California, and we have a number of lanes of refur refurbishment capability here at the Cape. Um, so there's different activities that we do, whether we're performing maintenance or we're, we're building a new one, but this was more so just happenstance that uh, due to the timing of this launch, this one was a new booster to come off the line, and um, we just we try to make sure that we have boosters ready uh, to support our, our customers' needs. Thank you. Yeah. And from a NASA perspective, we we like getting the new boosters. I mean, every time SpaceX puts a new booster in the fleet, they continue to make, I would say, safety improvements to the boosters, uh, better inspections of this booster in some areas than we've had in the past in terms of looking at the hardware. There's some robustness in the uh, aft part of the vehicle around the engines to uh, keep the plume from those engines for coming inside. There's many things, each booster that we get I think we might get a new booster again later on in Crew 6. So every one of those, we see Im improvements to it. So we, we like the, the reflown boosters, but again, getting a new booster for us, get some upgrades and some safety improvements, which, which we appreciate on the NASA perspective. So. Okay. So just highlight that the, the NASA certification process that tells us we are, we are go for flight is the same across the board, right? So safety and reliability is the top priority with every single booster, and it's all held to the same standard when we say we're go for launch. All right, when we have one other person on the phone, we have Joey Roulette again with Reuters. Hey, uh, thanks. I just had one follow-up for uh, Sergey. Um, how important is it for Russia to remain as an international space station partner? Um, would, would Russia be able to sustain its human spaceflight program if it were to pull out of the partnership in 2024? Or uh, what, what would that look like? Thanks. Uh, we are thinking about uh, building new uh, space station and we start uh, preliminary design of it. There is no final decision yet, but uh, we are going to keep flying International Space Station uh, as long as uh, our new uh, infrastructure will build. We don't know yet how it's going to be built and uh, what kind of uh, modules we will have, but uh, I'm sure that we will stay in international partnership when we fly ISS, and uh, future, future station, future in infrastructure is also going to be with international partnership. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We got to all the questions, so I now invite Kathy for any final remarks. So, like uh, I think Sergey mentioned, and Sergey, I think you got the, the brunt of the questions today, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, right now, you know, we are just through one phase. So obviously, great launch. We're very happy um, that the launch went so well. But now the team's really focused on getting the, the crew safely to the ISS. We once again are very grateful that our international partners are trusting us to be able to fly their crews. And we're also very grateful that SpaceX continues to be such a great partner for us and continue to fly our crews. And so looking forward to um, Nicole and Josh and Anna and uh, Koichi safely reaching the International Space Station tomorrow. And I know Joel's got a whole list of things for them to do when they get on orbit. So um, keep watching, keep following along. Um, hopefully it'll be very calm and boring mission and uh, we'll get there. And But um, also really, really, like I said at the beginning, want to thank all the teams. You all know what a tremendous um, endeavor this is and it takes people all over the country all over the world to get us to this point and so I really really want to thank the teams that have gotten us to this point thank you all for being here and thank you for your interest in crew 5 well, you heard Kathy. Keep watching, keep following along. So with that, coverage will continue on NASA TV through uh, docking at the space station, which is expected tomorrow, Thursday, October 6th at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll also stay on to cover the uh, welcome ceremony, which, as Joel said, is about 90 minutes after that. So until then, uh, just follow us along for any updates on our social media channels. And we're going to say goodbye with a beautiful replay of today's launch. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, engines full power, and lift off.
Stage one propulsion is nominal. Vehicle is pitching down range. Stage one propulsion is nominal. If you're just joining us, welcome to Mission Control Houston. We are live in the International Space Station Flight Control Room just about two hours after having a successful launch of NASA SpaceX Crew-5 mission to the International Space Station from the Kennedy Space Center at Launch Complex 39A in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Crew-5 has about a 29-hour flight to the space station. With two of those hours knocked off, the space station will continue chasing the International Space Station for just another 27 hours. We're expecting docking for the Crew-5 crew and Crew Dragon Endurance around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. SpaceX Dragon spacecraft carrying NASA astronauts Nicole Mann, the commander of Dragon, Josh Cassida, the pilot of Dragon, and mission specialist JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata and Ross Cosmos Cos cosmonaut Anna Kikina are on their way to the International Space Station. They have successfully reached orbit and have been chasing down the International Space Station for the past two hours. Dragon SpaceX for suit drying. Go 
ahead, Mike. Hey, Nicole. We just had noticed that uh, the suits have been uh, on, or the suit fans have been on for over 20 minutes on there. So we were just wanted to check in and make sure that uh, things were still going okay. Obviously, you can keep going until they are dry, but in case you all forgot, we just wanted to, to let you know that the 20 minutes on our end had run up. Okay, copy that. We'll give them a uh, another check and then um, get those fans off as soon as they're good. Twenty six copies. Much appreciated. You just heard confirmation from Commander Nicole Mann to the core out in SpaceX's Mission Control in Hawthorne, California. The core or the crew operations resource engineer, Michael Blasco, relayed to the crew that the time has elapsed on the drying of those suits that they doffed. They're currently seeing a live view in both MCCX, Mission Control for SpaceX on your left, and MCCH, Mission Control Houston on your right. MCCX, based in Hawthorne, California, is where teams monitor Dragon, checking all of its systems to help make sure the crew has a safe journey. They also have positions or consoles and the key six positions for monitoring the health of the vehicle and the crew. The mission director is responsible for mission success and is also in charge of the room, much like the flight director here in Mission Control Houston. The lead flight director for Crew 5 is Greg Whitney, who's currently on console and will be back tomorrow as well for docking of Crew Dragon. You see him here at the bottom of your screen. To his right is the capsule communicator. That's Leslie Ringo. She has the job to talk to the crew aboard the International Space Station. You heard me say core or the crew operations resource engineer. That's based in Hawthorne, California. They are currently talking to the crew aboard Dragon. Mission Control Houston is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Team members here are trained in a variety of disciplines and monitor all station systems. 
And again, that's the International Space Station systems that they monitor. These positions include Robo, which control the Canada Arm 2 for spacewalks. These positions also include CAPCOM and Flight Director, as we just spoke about. They also include ADCO, which controls the attitude or orientation of the space station. We also have a VVO, or a visiting vehicle officer, who monitors and works with the external teams sending spacecraft to and from the space station. Tomorrow we'll see the VVO jump into action as visiting vehicle, Crew 5's Crew Endurance spacecraft.